My guest today has won two Tony Awards for making audiences laugh in the play Peter and the Starcatcher and the musical Something Rotten. Now he's making audiences cry with his deeply moving work as Marvin in the glorious new revival of Falsettos. What more can I say? Welcome back to Show People, Christian Borrell. Well folded in. <laughs> Very nice. What would I do if you hadn't nailed that intro? <laughs> it, one take. Yep. One take, one torque. One and done. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm so happy. It's really yes. nice to be here. It's nice to see you. It's so good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Now let me get uh, something out of the way. You just recorded an album, mm -hmm. which I will be listening to for the rest of my life. No pressure. Well, me How too. did it go? <laughs> it was fantastic. It was surreal. We just did the cast recording yeah, for a Falsettos. Double, double disc. It's the first time that the whole show has been uh, put down on vinyl. Yeah. Um, vinyl. Oh, is there, will there be well, a vinyl? Kurt Deutsch, I think, is the type of guy that would put out a vinyl record. Yeah, I'm into that. But it's every second of the show. There are oh, no really? cuts. Okay. We were thrilled. It was slightly daunting because, like you, I listened to March of the Falsettos and yeah. Falsetto Land religiously growing up and even now kind of getting ready to do this show. I listened to it a little bit to yeah. familiarize myself with it, but I didn't want to listen to it too much. Right. And so we were in the studio. We were working very fast and furiously. And I was telling you before, we'd like get done with a song in two takes and they seemed happy and we just had that moment of like so that that was it that yeah. was our version of what more can i say yeah. and so we're all a little bit freaked out yeah. and but all very very excited you've been on a lot of great cast albums that that i Mm. enjoy mm -hmm. regularly. Do you interact with each other while you're recording? Fill it in, fill people in a little bit. Like, it's do you get to look at Andrew Rannells while you're singing? What more can I say? It's or? less interactive because of just where the directionally where the microphones are, where you have to pick up, and you're all separated by like sound booths. Yeah. And you all need to be able to see the conductor. So it's a little isolating, but we all know the show well enough now that we can kind of put ourselves there. So mm -hmm. no, Andrew did ask me if he needed to rest on my chest while I sang. What more can I say? And I I was able to do it without his full <laughs> weight on me. And I was also fully clothed, which was different. <laughs> and you wore the red shoes, I noticed. And, and you, were, you were wearing, so talk about this. You're wearing them today. You well, wore these on opening night. You these are, first of all, incredibly comfortable. These yeah, classic look, Air Jordans. We decided, um, Andrew. But it's become a thing. Well, uh, sure. Yeah. They, um, <laughs> for opening, Andrew very sweetly um, hooked us up because he does so much fancy stuff. Yes. Um, Brooks Brothers takes care of him. Okay. They're very generous, lovely people. Is Nike a Brooks Brothers? No, but he hooked us up. So it was um, Andrew, Brandon, young Anthony, and myself. So we were all going to get suits from Brooks Brothers. And I think it was Brandon said, we should all do one thing um, kind of as a nod to the 80s. And then the idea just came that we would be very comfortable all night long if we all wore classic Air Jordans. I love it. And now I just like them. Yeah. Yeah. All, all the falsettos guys. Yeah. I like that. That's a thing. Yeah. So how is life in falsetto land? I mean, when you've been, I know this is something you dreamt about. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a dream role. This is a, a dream Truly. idea. I know you sort of waited a few years, actually, for, for it to happen, um, for the production to get up. Mm -hmm. N now you're in it. It opened. Uh, you figured it out. It's a really cool new take on it. Mm -hmm. I love the new staging. Uh, Good. It's very fresh. It's very new. I love it, it too. made me cry like uh, really bad. Really bad. I've already mm -hmm. seen it twice. I'm obsessed with it. How does it feel to be in it and to be going to Falsetto Land every night? It's happening so fast. That's the hardest part of it. I mean, yeah. We threw it up really, really fast. We yeah. learned the music in three days. Wow. And then we were staging it. We staged basically in a week and a half because James Lapine just wanted it to start tech early mm -hmm. and he wanted us to get in the theater early because um, he likes to fine-tune everything later. Okay. And then suddenly we were in previews, and suddenly we were at opening night. Then now the recording has already come and gone. It'll and you're leaving in two months. In two months. So yeah. it's all a delightful blur. And the best part is we all um, get to the theater really early and kind of hang out. My dressing room has become a bit of a parlor, which is how I like mm, it. Nice. And so um, we are trying to make the most of every second. And... What's really nice about this show, too, more than a lot of other shows that I've done, everybody just kind of starts the show fresh. Like, nobody has to stand backstage for ten minutes and think about their character mm. and, like, get into some dark place, like, because we're going to make people cry, like, we have to be, like, right. reverent. It's all very light and breezy. And then we just start the show and do one song after the next. And before you know it, we have arrived the at show does the What work. Would I Do? It does. And it's because of Bill Finn and James Lapine. I don't have to, I've never had the experience where I just don't have to manipulate anything or ramp anything up. And I stand on stage at the end of the show and sing that song s just face to face with Andrew. It's just um, everything that I hoped it would be. 
and then it's over for the night. And people have been wonderfully moved. Everybody has their own reaction to the show. It's complicated. The thing that I've realized about doing this more than uh, a musical comedy is that people like to laugh together, mm -hmm. but they feel uncomfortable crying together. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So everyone is in the dark having their own emotional experience, whether you are moved or not moved, but crying can be a private thing. Mm. So even in people's reactions at the end of the show, it's hard to gauge really what people's thoughts are because people are still kind of coming out of the place that we put them in. Yeah. It's, it, well, Makes it's an sense? interesting show. I've had an interesting uh, experience watching people react to it too, watching people who don't know the show. Tell I, me. I grew up loving this show. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to see younger gay men mm -hmm. and women react to it. It comes from Bill Finn's DNA, I think, in a lot of ways, of how he, of his experience and of life um, at a time when AIDS was terrifying, when being gay was terrifying. And there's so many lyrics in it. You know, even at the, even at the end of the show when Mendel says, uh, homosexuals, uh, you know, we're a teeny tiny band. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's such a foreign concept mm -hmm. for, for like, y I, I feel like young gay guys now. It's, it, it's, it's almost like that's the thing that's sort of very different about it. We were talking earlier too about how much the internet has changed the theater community, yes. and even like theater celebrity, yeah. but it's changed entire communities. It's changed the gay community. Yeah. It's changed the transgender community. People right. feel less alone, Absolutely. less isolated, but certainly at that time, yeah. it's hard to imagine kind of like a movement happening in a, any kind yeah. of global sense. What I've seen is people have a hard time sort of processing all of that at first. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a, because it feels a little removed. And the emotion, I mean, it, the show works. And that, you know, when I heard a lot of people ahead of time say, like, it's false, that was going to work again is it and i'm like well, yeah because the show's brilliant yes and the characters and the, the storytelling is brilliant and the songwriting is brilliant so i wasn't worried about that that's the one thing that's different for younger audiences who have maybe grown up hearing especially i'm sure young gay musical theater guys who mm -hmm. grew up hearing oh falsettos is like sort of this great musical about us and it's not necessarily about them it's about sort of a generation yeah you know, that, that's what I find it really interesting. I agree with you. Yeah. Also, I think if you have any empathy whatsoever, there's something about the story and the music yeah. that Bill has written that it touches you and makes you think of other different types of relationships you've had. The story for me is that playing Marvin, who can't figure out how to love properly and yeah. is so clumsy figuring it out, and he figures out at the end of Act One kind of yeah. maybe more what love is and how to love uh -huh. in a better way and to be a man that he finally gets this, fa this tight-knit family that he's always wanted just at the very end. And mm. it's because he, he's the anti-Lewis in Angels in America. Mm. Like at the moment where he has to step up and be right. the best person he could possibly be, when Wizard gets sick, spoiler alert, he actually becomes his best person. And through that, everybody comes around him and they are able to surround him at the end. Let's talk about the end of Act One because okay. the, I, I, the, the final like ten minutes of Act One, the, the, what you were doing was it's stunning. It's a stunning performance. Thanks. First of all, but Mar uh, March of the Falsettos Act One is a very different show from Act Two. Truly, which is one, one of the things that's kind of hard for people to comprehend. They're written Nine many years, years apart. apart from each other, and you can tell mm -hmm. like Bill Finn's uh, music is very different, and the style is very different, and, and so when the show kind of starts. You know, there's a lot of talk about Marvin being this dark guy and maybe not sympathetic to the people he's hurt mm -hmm. in the beginning of the show. But he kind of just—you kind of come on stage and you say, "This is what happened. I left my wife. They have a kid. He makes this no is my apologies. boyfriend. How you doing?" But you're right. It builds. The end of Act One really builds. There's this beautiful father to son scene, mm -hmm. which it must be so emotional to play that. And with with young Anthony Rosenthal, who that kid, that kid's going places. He's he's great. He's unbelievable. What is it like doing that? Truly, and talk about beautiful lyrics also. I mean, like any, uh, just beautiful, beautiful lyrics mm -hmm. that anyone can relate to, what you sing to your son. What is that scene like, and mm -hmm. is it as emotional as it seems like it would be? And I have to detach a little bit from it, actually. Yeah. It's Anthony is unbelievable. Someone paid our troupe a great compliment saying, it was Colella, actually, who came uh -huh. to see the show. And she said, favorite Come from away, coming to Broadway. Yes, I cannot wait. Yeah. They're in Toronto right now. Yes. Yeah. Her favorite part of the show, and there were so many parts of it yeah. that she loved, was watching all of us take care of Anthony, both yeah. as actors and as characters. Because uh. he's, you know, the center, basically, of this whole show, and he right. carries it so beautifully and truthfully. Yeah. There's no performance happening with this kid. He just is amazingly good and open-hearted and sweet. 
So no, I sit there at the ice, you know, we sit knee to knee, and I'm singing this beautiful song. I'm not a father, so I'm, I'm just kind of imagining. I have incredibly fond memories of my own father, yeah. so there's pieces of that in there. But early on in the experience, I was trying to find ways of releasing all of the emotion that I was feeling just doing the show. Yeah. I was so honored to do the show, and I couldn't believe my luck that I was doing the show. And hearing all this music every day was making me emotional just as a person being around it. Then playing Marvin, if you're in it at all, yeah. and sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not, you get emotional. And so I was trying to release a little bit of emotion in the middle of that song. I thought it would be interesting for Jason to see his father cry for the first time. Right. Because that, that's a, an event for all of us when you see it, yeah. a, a man maybe your father or a different father figure cry, mm -hmm. it can be um, kind of a rite of passage for a, right. a child. So I thought that was moderately interesting. And it was James Lapine who said, S don't save it, just save it. Mm. I don't want to see any of that. Let them have the experience, keep it inside, hmm. tamp it down. And so because of that, I've actually, the exercise at the end of the show has been just kind of like suppressing all of that and just sitting there and not letting any of it out. Right, what was your father like? And when did, mm -hmm. your, when did you actually lose your father? What, what, what point in your career? My dad died March 2011, mm -hmm. right as Peter and the Starcatcher was opening downtown. Okay. I actually left to say goodbye to him, like when it was clear that he was, maybe had a, a few days wow. left. Um, I missed a rehearsal or a tech and went down and uh, and then came back. Because he was sick for a while? He was sick for over a year. Uh -huh. He had really aggressive radiation treatment for prostate cancer, which wow. every man, if you live long enough, is gonna get some form of prostate right. cancer. But you hear that C word, and so he had this treatment, which I think wrecked his, basically his immune system. Wow. Um, anyway, it, it was uh, a year and a half of, of watching him get weaker and weaker. It's, it was, it's obviously, uh, I'm devastated by his loss because he was, my mother will be mad at me because we don't, we're a family that doesn't believe in saying loss or passes away. We're very much like a he died family. Okay. So when he died, it was devastating. Because um, he was a very, very gentle, sensitive, smart, funny man. Mm. Swiss French, he had a very debonair accent. And I liked having like a non, I, that I, I didn't have like an American dad, not to disparage uh -huh. the American dad, but right. you know what I mean. That he was um, European, uh, informed a lot of my sensibilities, and of course the Swiss part of it made me incredibly punctual at all times in my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. um, and so, I, Kalela also mentioned, she never met my dad, that she could see what my dad must have been like in uh -huh. my performance in Marvin, which, which is wow. a great compliment. When you do a show like Falsettos versus doing something like a comedy or something mm -hmm. maybe lighter, do, does it make you sort of think more about these deeper things in life or, or no? I mean, you talk about sort of living with the music and obviously the emotion of the music. Yeah. Does, it, does it make you think about, do you want to be a father? Have you thought about those things? Or <laughs> does, does it make you think about your father? And does it, make, does, does it bring all that up? Or as an actor, do you just sort of not necessarily get affected by a show in that way? It does affect you. It hasn't changed my mind about wanting to be a father necessarily. The only times that I've ever really thought about that, it's because my dad was such a good father mm -hmm. that I would want to kind of be the same kind of dad that he was to somebody right. else. But I also, I value my autonomy too much to, to care for uh, a child at this point in my life, okay. or a dog for that matter. My favorite thing <laughs> in the world is other people's dogs, because <laughs> you get to have all that and then, okay, now you go pick up their crap. So you don't want any, nothing's tying you down? No. No, um, and I get to um, flit off and uh, act on the great American stage. I'm uh -huh. married to my work. It's such a cliche, but it's great. Yeah. And the, of course, one of the greatest gifts of the show is meeting a whole new group of amazing people. We have all fallen madly in love with each other. And I've gotten to have an incredible uh, onstage love affair with Andrew Reynolds. And yeah. I knew it would happen. I yeah. knew we'd work together briefly on other things and even did a little... Um, Little Miss Sunshine, early early right. versions of that yeah, yeah. together. We always got along, but we knew that this was going to be a good fit, and we started off very quickly being 
like building an affectionate relationship with each other. And even at one point, Lapine basically was like, what, why are you guys always hanging all over each other? We're like, just let it be. We're trying to figure out our like <laughs> dynamic. And, uh, and ultimately, he, he was very sweet about it. He Later on, he was like, I see what you guys are doing. Mm. Great. Interesting. Um, yeah. He has been, James Lapine has been, um, I worked with him, um, I was a cover for Amour. Right. I watched that process. Right. And it was fascinating to watch everybody kind of get on his same page with this show. We all had kind of preconceived ideas, I think, mm -hmm. about how we wanted to do it. Or, and we right. all have our bag of tricks. And he very much likes living in a place where there is not a performative aspect to things. Mm -hmm. He just wants you to be on stage. He doesn't necessarily want you to entertain. Right. Which, after something rotten, is a, a major, <laughs> yeah. major left turn, and it's I'm quite sure. liberating in that way. Yeah. And so there are moments where I can only speak for myself, where I find myself on stage not doing anything, and I guess it's working for this. Like, you just, like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm reacting in a very right. small way to whatever's going on, but I'm not making, like, choices and trying to, like, uh -huh. show you that I'm performing Marvin. Uh -huh. And it's <laughs> really, really liberating and exciting to do that and to trust it. And what was it like to be in through the whole experience with Bill Finn and James mm. Lapine, who are, uh, Bill, Bill Finn is, mm. you know, I'm such a, a, a fanboy of his. And I watched your Bill Finn interview, it was <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> he terrifies me in the, in the best way. Did you get any like sort of amazing stories about the creation of this or insight about this? Or were they just kind of like, we're just here making a new No, they, they were so excited. They and uh, Ira Weissman and Andre Bishop. Yeah. The first day of rehearsal, we sat in a circle together. And basically, the four of them spoke about the genesis. But watching them kind of remember together how it all came together was fun and fascinating and informative. They were asking old questions of each other of like, what does that even mean? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> to have, there is something very liberating about asking Bill Finn, like, what does that lyric mean? And having him say, like, I don't know. <laughs> and so you're all like, okay, well, then none of us knows. So maybe the audience will know. And I do, I won't tell you where they are because I don't want people to watch for them. But there are moments on stage where I will sing a lyric or even an, an entire song. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> I hope that made sense because <laughs> I'm not exactly sure that it's That's did. what I love about it. <laughs> yes. And what I love about, th about the score in general is I know it by heart. Mm -hmm. And when I watch it, the lyrics constantly engage me. Mm -hmm. I love that I'm always understanding everything about where the character's coming from, but I'm also getting fresh insight. And it's mm -hmm. also always a little bit off. There's always these moments, like you said, where you're just like, the hell does that mean? But then yeah. it means something in the moment. And it's poetry too. And yeah, I've, I've, absolutely. I've, my father went through a phase with poetry where he, um, my sister as well, I was never a, a huge in college, or in high school rather, I took a class about poetry and it never resonated with me at all. I think maybe now older, uh, yeah. I have maybe an understanding, like it's not necessarily meant to be understood. Right. Some of it's meant to be felt, and some of it's meant to be shift and change over the course of years. Right. But it's fascinating to act poetry. So how excited are you for November 25th? So that's a big day in your life. Do you know why? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> because you say you're a Gilmore Girls fan. Oh, shit, yeah. And there's this thing called Gilmore Girls. Right, right. What is it? Colin, A, a Year day in, in the, the Life. A Year, year in the Life. A Year in the Life. life uh, on Netflix. Yeah. And you're on it. Yes. And you play the, the, the pivotal role of actor. Yeah, I think his IMDb. name is Gary, I think. Actor. Right? Well, no, it says actor. Your credit sure. is actor forever yeah. on IMDb. But Great. Uh, and then somebody else plays actress. Who's that? That's Sutton Foster. Sutton Foster. Mm -hmm. Now, this was very exciting. For fa I'm a fan of both of yours, and, and I love both of you. And it's exciting to mm -hmm. see you do something together. Yeah. And I think a lot of people were like, what the hell? They're doing something together? Mm -hmm. Because you were married. Right. And so And then they were no longer. And right. you were no longer married. <laughs> That's right. So people assume that that means uh, that you can't work together or, or be friends. or But you've right. sort of proven over time that you're actually very supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that. How did that come about? Being And, and I know when you were married, I remember, I remember you actually both telling me we're that you were obsessed with Gilmore, Gilmore Girls. Girls. It I was the first <laughs> thing that we binge-watched. We were at my friend Dan Levine's house. Uh -huh. He had a house in the Poconos years ago. And we were there for New Year's Eve, and the heat was out, and there was nothing to do except watch TV. And so <laughs> Gilmore Girls came on, and we're like, I heard this is kind of good. And that was the beginning of our love affair with Gilmore Girls. And the DVD sets would come out, and we would just sit and devour them as we remember now the know. Remember the DVD it's, sets? It's binge Remember we had to wait for those? That's right. <laughs> um, so we always loved it. Um, and then years later, 
Sutton got to meet Dan and Amy Sherman Palladino. Yeah. They did Bunheads together. Right. They became fast, good family friends. Yeah. And then a couple years after that, uh, Sutton and her husband Ted were out to dinner with Dan and Amy. And Dan and Amy mentioned to Sutton that this Gilmore Girls was going to be happening again at Netflix. And they wanted to offer her this role as actress <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in this musical within the Stars Hollow world. And, um, and it, it's because of Sutton and her generosity and sweetness. She said, I have to tell you, Christian and I were huge fans if you could find it in your heart. And as she tells it, Dan said, done, got it. I already know what I'm going to do. It's already written in my head. That's it. So they reached out to me, and they made us co-stars of this Stars Hollow musical. And we had so much fun. You got to be on the set, obviously. <laughs> yes. You got to be there. We walked, you know, the holding room was in uh, Luke's cafe. <laughs> and it, we, it was really surreal and really, really beautiful. And, you know, Sutton and I were first and foremost friends going back to college. Yeah. And then fans of each other's work. And we've always made each other laugh hysterically. And we were doing this, these different numbers that Janine Tesori wrote. And some of them were half choreographed and some of them were not. So every m we shot for two, two days. We'd get there in the morning and rehearse these numbers. And we would basically like, well, what do you want to do with this thing? And we would just, just figuring it out? figure it out <laughs> and make each other laugh hysterically. And at one point, we were dressed as uh, pilgrims. And she turned to me, and she had this like pilgrim hat. And we kind of like time change, come out of it, and we like look up at each other dressed as pilgrims and she, her face was framed in this thing and I could, could barely get through each and every take <laughs> just because she is, as you know, one of the funniest people on the face of the earth. <laughs> so it was a dream. I can't wait to see it. I, it's going to be bizarre. Isn't it? It's kind of sad that everyone assumes that you and Sutton can't be friends. Because you know what I mean? That two people who are divorced can't... Well, you know what I mean? to bring it back to falsettos, uh, I think what is a worthwhile story is, you know, how do you move past something right. like that? Yeah. And how do you figure out what family means? And yeah. I think, you know, Sutton and I had a conversation years ago, this is m moderately private, but I don't think she'd mind me saying it, is, you know, we were having a drink and basically saying, like, we are family to each other. And if you need anything, you know, we've right. known each other since we were kids and, you know, just because yeah. you have an experience and then come out the other side of it and have experienced some kind of pain and hurt mm -hmm. and it doesn't negate the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Can we talk about vintage? <laughs> yeah. I miss vintage. I do too. <laughs> vintage was a great bar on 9th Avenue. 51st and 9th. 51st and 9th. Now it's a gay bar. Mm -hmm. as th uh, that's 9th Avenue for you. That's, that's, right. that's what's happened to 9th Avenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Um, they had amazing nachos. They did? I don't know if you remember that. They had like 3,000 different kinds of martinis. Mm -hmm. And they had a great bartender mm -hmm. named Christian Borrell. They for, for a short time, yes, did that's right. actually, you were, It was like a big theater hangout. <laughs> yes. But weren't you actually working there around the time that Millie happened and all that? Yes. You were, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Sh Sutton would be in rehearsals and in tech, and, go and I would be at Vintage, and I would stumble home. and. Uh, you know, booze spilled all over my black. Stumble home because you were working till four o'clock in the morning. Oh, okay, not wasted. Well, that too, because <laughs> that's the glory of being a bartender. <laughs> but um, no, <laughs> interestingly, uh, after that, one of my good friends, Jeffrey Dottillo, who was in uh, Spamalot, uh -huh. uh, he was bartender there after me, and they came up with a whole martini menu based on different people's names. Okay. And my, for whatever you random reason, I had a martini that was called Christian's Erotica. I don't know why. And my father used to come into Vintage because whenever my parents and my sister would come into town, we'd all go to Vintage. Right, there was a, a for the nachos. Manager there uh, that, was, that was me at least. But really, <laughs> um, Freddie, this guy who used to work there and manage the place, was always uh, so welcoming and gracious and lovely to my family. So we would go there, and my father used to sidle up to the bar, and he would say to Jeffrey, may I please have my son's erotica? <laughs> 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 yeah. Heady times. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I was <coughs> thinking back to when I first met you. I literally think I met you like on opening night of Millie. Mm. I remember like doing the red carpet. I remember mm -hmm. you being there. Mm -hmm. And then and then I remember when you went into Millie. Mm -hmm. That was like a great opportunity for you. Yeah. Because I was looking back on all the things we've done with you over the years, and you talked about you 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 called Sutton's performance in Millie like the great most 
the greatest stage performance you've ever seen, I think, mm -hmm. which I agree. It was it's still, it's, it's way phenomenal. up there, yeah. It's funny, I had Shirley Ralph on last week, mm -hmm. and she, she was obviously in the original cast of Millie, although she probably was gone by the time you went into it. Yes. But she, she said that Sutton had the eye of the tiger. She had the yes. eye of the tiger back then. Yeah. She grabbed it. She did. And I like thinking now, now that you, you and Sutton are like these Broadway institutions now, for, for Tony Awards, um, between you. Mm -hmm. I like to think you two are like evilly plotting like wow, we're gonna take over Broadway. <laughs> we're gonna take over Broadway. Yeah. It was so much dorkier than that. No, <laughs> we were just so excited. So excited. You have another job after this. I mean, this, I is do. this is what's amazing about the career of Christian Borle right now. You've known now for months that mm -hmm. you have, you're doing falsettos through January mm -hmm. and then you're leaving the show and hopefully the show will keep going. That's, mm -hmm. that's my hope. Mm -hmm. And then you're going right into uh, a little Charlie and the Chocolate. Yeah, action. just a little, a little musical. Mm -hmm. A little a huge, boutique musical. I mean, enormous musical. Yeah, playing Willy Wonka, mm -hmm. iconic Willy Wonka. Maybe like the most iconic role you played. I don't know. I mean, that's that's. I mean, that's pretty. Well, sh uh, yeah, Shakespeare for the snobs. But how are you feeling? I mean, that. What's it like as an as a working actor to know that you have like the next eighteen months locked up? I mean, that is the best part. I mean, it's and also crazy. knowing that the people that I'm about to be working with are some of the best. Yeah, and I love them all deeply. So we're gonna have a great. Yeah. You know, I love rehearsing. Yeah. I love teching. I love getting into the theater. I love all of that fun stuff. And then we'll be heading into the, uh, the whole end of the season stuff, which is very fun. Yeah, and you'll be eligible for two. That's 20s. crazy. That's crazy. It's crazy. You have against yourself. Hmm. It's going to sound pretentious to say, but like truly the only thing I can think about right now is falsettos. Yeah. And of trying course. to enjoy every precious second. But it obviously feels so nice to have a job after this and one that is going to be sitting at the Lunt Fountain hopefully for a while. So does that take uh, like a pressure off you mentally, like to, to know totally. that like like then what do you do? What do you do with that energy? What do you do with the energy you normally would do worrying about your next job? <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you do with all that? That's a good question. <laughs> I do the present job. Come on, you can get a dog. Yeah. You can handle a dog. I just don't want to go outside three times a day and pick up poop. <laughs> <laughs> really, fundamentally. Really, just I mean, something about it, that. Who just wants to do that? I mean, I guess you it's worth it. some just, of the love. You just, I know. Just bend over and do it. It's fine. That that didn't sound right. Nope. That um. <laughs> sounded just right. Are you gonna look crazy? Is it gonna be like a crazy getup? Do we know? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. We've had. I have some ideas. I don't want it to be too esoteric. Mm -hmm. Like thinking about Sweet Gene Wilder. Yeah. Like it wasn't too crazy, and I think where. All due respect to Johnny Depp, where that yeah. went kind of off the rails. Yeah, yeah. It's like overthinking yeah. the eccentricity of it. I think he should be in some ways like recognizable and human. Yeah. And likable and, yeah. and like, just happens to be a chocolate genius who's been like shut in for 20 years. Has Johnny Depp called you to congratulate you? Not that you a have peep. <laughs> <laughs> so... You are leaving Falsettos on what's the date? January 8th. So who do you think should play Marvin? I've been joking the whole time um, because as we were kind of teching, uh, James um, was around overseeing the Sunday in the Park that they did at oh Encores. Yeah, and which so, was you know, as we always joke about star Did you get casting. to see it? You didn't I did. We saw you did a dress rehearsal. Oh, you got to see it. Great. So the whole time, even in, in our rehearsals, I was joking that Jake Gyllenhaal would obviously be taking over Marvin. And then when they canceled uh, Burn This, I was like, well, <laughs> he's cleared his slate for this. But I was always kind of like joking about it. But I have to say, I went into Sending the Park not necessarily, maybe with my arms folded a little bit. I thought he was amazing. Amazing. And sounded amazing yeah. in a way that I was not expecting. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I was expecting like some maybe a pleasant voice, but maybe some machine gun vibrato. Right. Or maybe <laughs> like not much of a range. But yeah. he had it all, I thought, and really interesting different parts of his voice. He's been keeping it a secret. I, he it's crazy, really right? blew me away. And Annalie. Emily just killed me. Yeah, that show killed me. We went on a day off. And I was like, "Oh, good," and then just more bawling. Just yeah, hot thanks, tears. Lapine. I know. <laughs> so you're saying Jake uh, Gyllenhaal for Marvin? Gyllenhaal? Yeah, I joked about it, but I think he'd be great. I think he'd be great too. Yeah, I'm into it. Let's make that happen. All right. It was so nice to see you. You too. It was so nice to not have to talk about cod pieces. Mm. You know, mm. you, you move past that. Yeah. A, a more mature <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Christian Borrell, <Burrell>, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> sure. For now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being no, here. Thanks for Great having me back. You. you too. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.